Thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation to come here. I'm operating on about four hours sleep, courtesy of American Airlines. Okay, so I'm going to talk today based on practical experience as an NIH-funded principal investigator um, who has gone through this process. Uh, so first of all, what does the world look like from my standpoint? We get happy news from NIH. Your grant has been funded. We uh, formulate a proposal for our IRB to give us authority to do human subjects research. Because it involves return of results into a medical record, we need to uh, have a laboratory developed test that conforms to the CLIA standards. Uh, in California, we have the joyous duplication of this effort, uh, whereby the state also regulates us independently and authorizes our LDT results return. And then most recently, we have the FDA pre-submission and IDE mechanism. As you can see, that's a lot of stuff. And if you want to get research done in a hurry, this is not the way to do it. I'm not saying that there's a problem here. It's just that's a lot of stuff uh, if we're going to make uh, progress towards the realization of genomic medicine before it goes direct to consumer, which is our great fear. So our hypotheses that we were funded to explore were relatively simple. They were that genome sequencing, if performed rapidly in acutely ill infants in two locations, neonatal intensive care, pediatric intensive care units, who were thought likely to have a single gene disease, would increase the rate of diagnosis, decrease the time to diagnosis, and improve the precision of acute medical care. The backdrop is that there are literally thousands of these diseases, and so a new strategy was needed that would be comprehensive as opposed to, to, to traditional testing, which, as you can see below, is sort of a, an, on a case-by-case -case basis decided in consultation with medical genetics, and really not something that, as, as a nation, as a healthcare industry, people can practice in most healthcare settings. So most babies do not receive this type of testing and likely will not get a diagnosis during their hospital stay and may not get a diagnosis before they die. These diseases are the leading cause of death in the NICU, in the PICU, and in infants in general. So uh, September the 4th, I believe it was, we uh, started our U19 grant. Uh, U19s are different from other uh, NIH grants in as much as they give a huge amount of oversight of the program by the program manager and by our peers. So there were four funded centers and we were on phone calls at least once every two weeks where we discuss pertinent uh, aspects of our research. So this is a highly regulated mechanism for doing clinical research. About a month after the grant started, we um, had a call from the FDA to ask, um, could we uh, enlighten them in terms of the work that we were, pro were proposing to do? And subsequently, and, and our other three centers had similar phone calls, and subsequently our program managers were uh, notified that uh, we would need to go through a pre-submission inquiry and maybe an IDE. Uh, none of us really knew what that meant, and so we collectively put on our thinking hats. We had numerous phone calls, we shared materials, and uh, we submitted our uh, inquiry at month six. So let's take a look at what that involved. Um, this is the process, as David has shown you. For us, that was a 13-page document with the following contents. Um, specifically a device description. Uh, let's show you that. This is our device. Uh, we had many, many, many conversations about what the device meant because as academics, we don't think device. Uh, we think experimental design. We think technologies. We're familiar with the term laboratory developed test, but device is not something that we build. Um, we typically have many components which we hook together, uh, typically informatically, to give an end result. 
Uh, I'll walk you through this incredibly fast. And so we have an enrollment process, followed, and before that, an ascertainment process. Information is collected in a REDCap uh, database. We collect a blood sample if the patients are enrolled, uh, extract DNA. These are standard processes. Turn that into a sequencing library. This is PCR free. Uh, and then sequence them. And in our case, this was on a HiSeq 2500 predominantly in rapid run mode. The resultant information then is fed into a high performance disk uh, and then into a compute cluster where it goes through these transitions in file formats, giving us a list of variants that may be causative of the infant's symptoms. Those are annotated with a, se a separate software tool. In parallel with this process, we uh, enter the clinical features of the baby and correlate those with the 8,200 known genetic diseases to prioritize a differential diagnosis. And these are then integrated using a software system that allows rapid variant interpretation. The information similarly goes to a database, a master database. Ultimately, uh, as part of the mechanism of award, we have a requirement to deposit this in public databases. In terms of interpretation reporting, by and large, uh, we perform a confirmatory Sanger test to confirm what we see based on our genome sequence. But uh, in exceptional circumstances, we provide a verbal report to the ordering physician uh, in advance of that confirmatory test. And I'll explain a little bit more about you. So that's our take on the device. The proposed or intended use, uh, this is a randomized controlled prospective study. The inclusion and exclusion criteria are listed. Uh, the group sizes, uh, parents and clinicians were uh, given pretest questionnaires to understand the milieu, if you will, in terms of their hopes and fears regarding this novel type of testing. And then rapid genome sequencing was performed. Uh, return of diagnostic results was either verbal, if the child was about to die, uh, and the result could potentially change the outcome. But in the vast majority of cases, weighted Sanger confirmation and with standard, uh, a standard report placed in a chart. In some cases, the results were not clear in terms of uh, whether this was a diagnosis or not. Uh, in some cases, we did not make a diagnosis. And there was the opportunity for physicians to cross a patient over into the WGS arm if they felt that the patient uh, had to get that, uh, which uh, increasingly they did during the study. And then after test results, and at some point later, there were additional follow-up questions to get information related to diagnostic and clinical utility, and also, again, parents uh, social, legal, ethical uh, type um, information. Um, an another part of the device was to understand had it been validated. And uh, this was a device that was in development. Uh, the grant had three components. And component one was to continue to develop the de device during the five years of award. Uh, as I say, we didn't refer to it as a device, but um, we started to. Um, and so with time, analytic performance improved. This is about its current analytic sensitivity and specificity. And as you can see from the area under the rock curve, next-gen sequencing is maybe the most sensitive and specific test ever to be developed in terms of its analytic performance looking at nucleotide variation. That's both single nucleotide substitutions and small insertion and deletion events. We also had information on the diagnostic performance and its comparator to all gold standard methods combined. And so we had reason to believe that the diagnostic performance, albeit this is a retrospective study, was superior and then lastly, did it make a difference to have that information? Yes, it did. We had one life saved. 
uh, we had four cases in which there was a medication change, sort of the definition of um, precision medicine, um, three cases in which major morbidity was avoided. Um, this was maybe the most important slide, uh, which was that there was not much room for time delays uh, in a NICU or PICU environment, that by 100 days of life, over 50% of babies with a genetic diagnosis would have died, and therefore delaying return of results uh, was not in the best interests of the child um, and spoke to the relative risk and harms of returning an unconfirmed result, albeit one with quite superb analytic specs versus uh, Sanger confirmation, uh, taking about a week to, to perform. So after um, less than two months, uh, we had an initial FDA response. The FDA responded to us with a series of questions, and we had a teleconference shortly thereafter. Um, I'll just go through this very quickly. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, but this shows you the actual questions and our responses and how we formatted this. Um, and so largely these were clarifications of specific items in our 13-page document that required additional explanation. Um, and for many of these, we had to actually go back. This was a learning curve. There was a different language being spoken and we needed to sort of get our heads around how the FDA thinks about research, which is fairly different from, say, a CLIA CAP lab director's thought or an IRB member's thought. So there were questions about uh, when and where we would do um, confirmatory testing. Um, this was back in 2014, remember, when that was uh, normative uh, in all cases. Uh, the FDA sought clarification about what was a high likelihood disease-causing variant um, that we were able to show uh, relatively simply based on published ACMG criteria. Uh, process for determining whether a verbal disclosure uh, would occur and who did it and to whom. And we walked through that. Um, and. You know, this was a rare event. I think we had two of these events in a three-year period. A um, bit more information about this, uh, a little bit more information about the actual information we were placing in the medical record. Um, additional clarification about VUS. Um, whether there was any other mechanism to return an unconfirmed result. Um, this was something else. Uh, lastly, there was questions about blood draws and whether these would be higher than what our institution allowed in infants. And some of the infants we were enrolling were premature. Uh, were there other, any other uh, samples being retained? And then lastly, our question for the FDA was, uh, do we require to proceed to the investigational device exemption proposal? Um, we were notified in writing a couple of days later that no, that was not required, that this was a not significant risk proposal. Our understanding was that there was risk. This was a, uh, an experimental device. However, uh, in this uh, somewhat unique setting of high acuity illness in infants, with high morbidity and mortality that the benefits exceeded the harms. Um, and so we were then able to start enrollment. Uh, I'm just going to finish up because that's not the end of the story. Uh, this is a five-year uh, project. Uh, I have now moved to a new institution. The technologies are now rather different than they were back in 2014. Uh, for example, we can now decode a genome and return a result in 26 hours. Uh, previously, the speed limit was 50 hours. Uh, this is our device these days. Uh, as you can see, the level of complexity uh, has gone up at least an order of magnitude. Uh, these days, we use genome or exome sequencing interchangeably. 
We have a variety of sequencing instruments. And furthermore, as is normative now, we often outsource this to CLIA and CAP-approved uh, external laboratories who will undertake these processes for us, and we rely on their CLIA-CAP accreditation and QC uh, controls. We do the analysis in-house. Um, some of the components are similar, but as you can see, there are a lot more of them now. Uh, and as you can see, they now involve both cloud-based solutions as well as local solutions. And by and large, there is a lot of duplication and redundancy that we are rarely using a single tool to make a diagnosis. We still have the bottom line here that confirmatory assays are normative, uh, but increasingly we are giving our lab director uh, of oversight of that, as is generally the case uh, around the country uh, for uh, diagnostic results return. Uh, in part, this is based on the improved analytic performance which, as I showed you, has significantly improved as we understand the components better, and partly by this fairly seminal paper where Leslie Biesecker and colleagues showed that Sanger sequencing actually was not a good test to validate uh, next-gen sequencing results in as much as it was more likely to incorrectly refute a true positive than to correctly identify a false positive. Uh, and so information such as this is uh, making us uh, take this on a case-by-case -case basis in individual laboratories and relying heavily on our own experience. Um, I would say that we need to remember that this manuscript spoke only to substitution events where we know that next generation sequencing really does have 99.999 something uh, sensitivity and specificity. For indel events, uh, the paper did not speak to that, and I would argue that it's still premature to, um, to not confirm those by Sanger confirmation, but I think this is an area where different labs will, will have different approaches. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't run over my time. Thank you, Stephen. And I think I really liked your analysis that um, that everyone is speaking a different language, and I hope today's forum can act as sort of a translator and help to develop a dictionary for um, the different dialogues between research and, and regulatory science. Um, next, uh, we have Dr. Paula Capacino, who is a scientific reviewer in the Division of Chemistry and Toxicology Devices in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics at FDA.